everyone and welcome to the 11th meeting of the Welfare Reform Committee for 2013. Could everyone please make sure that mobile phones and electronic devices are switched off? Uh, we've received apologies this morning from Ian Gray and Kevin Stewart and Kenny Gibson is intending this morning in place of Kevin, so welcome again Kenny to the committee. We go to agenda item one, which is on uh, considering whether to take item four in private. Item four is consideration of the committee's approach to scrutiny of the budget, uh, sorry, the Scottish Government's draft budget of 2014-15. The members agree to take that item in yep, private? Indeed. Thanks very much. Agenda item two is our fact-finding visits. Um, the, this is an opportunity to report back to the committee on recent fact-finding visits to the local authorities. The committee has been conducting a series of fact-finding visits to Department of Work and Pensions and Scottish Government welfare reform pilots in local authorities. The pilot areas are, experiment, are experimenting principally with support services in advance of the introduction of welfare reform changes from October 2013. The committee agreed at its meeting on the 26th of March to visit all six pilots along with West Lothian Council and the New Horizons Group in the Borders. Visits to Dumfries and Galloway Council and New Horizons Borders are planned for the near future. However, to date, fact-finding visits have taken place to the following local authorities, Aberdeenshire, Dundee City, North Lanarkshire, South Lanarkshire, Western Bartonshire and West Lothian. So, what I'll do now is invite uh, a representative from each of the visits to report back to the committee with their findings on those uh, fact-finding visits. So I'll go first to Aberdeenshire. Alex uh, was there along with Kevin. So Alex, you want to take us through what your impressions were of the, the situation? Thank you very much, convener. Uh, I had content to myself with the idea that I would let Kevin do the talking. I usually find this the most comfortable approach. Uh, but since Kevin's not here, I will have to uh, say a few words on it myself. Uh, Aberdeenshire have uh, taken forward uh, their pilot uh, in a very engaged and constructive way, uh, I believe. They have uh, put in place the opportunity to claim housing benefit, council tax reduction, and in addition to this, uh, it's possible to claim uh, or to use the assess, assess the entitlement for free school meals, school clothing grants, single person discounts. The project went live on Tuesday the 21st of May and they have already had considerable experience of people who have begun to interact uh, in this way. Interestingly enough, they find that uh, there are individuals who are going through the process uh, to assess their entitlement and choosing not to complete it. There were other examples of people who had begun to engage in the process and come back to it uh, over a period of time before completing it. Uh, so that there is a, a considerable amount of experience building up. In terms of the software they're using, uh, they've chosen to use an off-the-shelf uh, software package rather than to try and build a system for themselves. Uh, they have found that this is working effectively and it's integrated within uh, the Council's website. Uh, it's also, they find, an extremely cost-effective uh, way to go forward, given that uh, there is what they believe is a, a fairly limited cost associated with running the software. They, as things go on, they, they have at the moment still uh, a requirement for signatures uh, to go on applications, which is slightly complicated, but they are uh, at a point where they hope to get to a point where uh, online applications can be dealt with without a signature. I think there's a legal uh, issue to be sorted out before they can do that. In terms of support, uh, at the moment, uh, they're simply uh, allowing people to apply online uh, who have the, the opportunity to access the necessary equipment and the, the broadband connection. But they have plans to roll out uh, opportunities at libraries and are even considering the possibility of uh, changing uh, or improving the skills of staff in order to support that. They will also have uh, available individuals who can, uh, if necessary, uh, visit people uh, in their homes with the necessary equipment to go through the online applications with them if that level of support is required. So the experience so far is that uh, they believe that the interactions that have taken place are positive and they have plans in place to uh, ex to have a much broader interaction uh, with people to support them in the online application process. Okay. 
Thanks very much, uh, Alex. I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll take all the reports and then we'll have a sort of general discussion about the information that we find, if that's agreeable to everyone. Uh, Dundee City, Annabelle, are you going to report back on that? Yes, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, good morning. Uh, so I attended yesterday on behalf of the committee at Dundee City Council and uh, Heather uh, Lyle came along as well. Um, and we met with uh, the Chief Exec and the Director of Housing, uh, key council officials and also the Leader of the Council, Ken Guild, and the Convener of Housing. Um, so we obtained an overview of um, what they're doing in general terms and then uh, there was a focus on certain specific issues. Um, we were told that welfare reform has a very high priority within the Council and indeed they formed a, working, a corporate working group a while back um, uh, made up of senior Council members and staff to coordinate across the services. There are seven work streams. Uh, and the work streams are as follows, universal credit, uh, council tax reduction, social welfare fund, uh, personal independence payment, housing services, uh, supporting initiatives, employability and learning. Uh, they meet monthly. Uh, there is uh, good involvement with local DWP staff. Uh, they did make a comment about uh, perhaps less uh, helpful involvement of the DWP centrally. Um, and um, they, they work across um, a department and across all services uh, to provide uh, this uh, structure and this service. Um, all members of staff across the council have had or will receive uh, basic training on the impact of welfare reform in the form of a mandatory e-learning module. And this will also be shared with housing associations locally. Um, uh, any frontline member of staff uh, as a result of that e-learning module should be able to signpost and make appropriate referrals uh, uh, to other uh, council services as appropriate. Um, and uh, that the, the key point here is that this is all members of frontline staff, not just those specifically involved with, with welfare issues. Um, and the council has been working in partnership with um, other organisations, including uh, local voluntary organisations uh, and uh, health services. Uh, also, it has uh, been working with local credit unions and has taken a very strong stance against payday loan companies, and there's no access, for example, to payday loan companies through the local library uh, uh, network of uh, computer access. Um, they have a bespoke welfare, action, uh, re welfare reform action plan, and what happens is there's an individual will go in and have a face-to-face -face meeting, an initial meeting, and the, there will be a provision of basic information, names, address, number of people in the household, dates of birth, uh, benefits and receipt of as far as they're aware and so forth. And as a result of that, there'll be cross referrals to welfare rights or to money advice or to options, housing options, employability services. But the key point is that this uh, meeting is, is short, it's direct, it's, um, it's uh, not intimidating for the individual, for the claimant, and that you don't have to bring lots of pieces of paper with you. You have a meeting, the computer programme is set up in such a way that there's early triggers to point you uh, to other uh, services in terms of information that would then be required to be obtained and so forth. Um, and uh, I think it's, uh, it seems to be a very user-friendly uh, uh, approach, and the staff certainly um, are, are enjoying doing it. Um, what you have is, I did a test, you end up with a welfare, action, a welfare reform action plan, uh, and I think the personalisation of it also is, is a help because you're not simply being presented with a generic document full of gobbledygook. You're actually being presented with something that you know, is going to help you take the necessary steps to see that you get everything that you're entitled to get and any help that you can receive. Uh, in terms of communication, also they have cards such as these throughout the city uh, where there's a dedicated website. There is one single phone line in to get the first um, point of contact about welfare reform uh, advice. Uh, they have um, book cards and libraries because they will be using their library service uh, quite extensively. They have beefed up a computer presence in libraries. They'll be seeking voluntary uh, uh, help from voluntary bodies with uh, assistance in libraries, and they have increased their computer presence in council buildings uh, across uh, Dundee. Um, in terms of particular issues, obviously the bedroom tax uh, is a particular issue. Uh, uh, the, uh, the time it would likely take to deal with the gap as between current uh, one-bedroom properties available and the demand for that further to the welfare reform changes 
is likely to take about eight years uh, to sort out. Um, they anticipate that the under-occupancy penalty is expected to be about £2.1 million pounds per annum and their discretionary housing payment is sitting at £461,000. That's 311000 of a grant and they've topped it up with £150,000. Uh, uh, as a result of the gap between the amount of DHP and the demand, they are having to ration uh, uh, DHP. Um, in terms of uh, challenges coming, they are very concerned, obviously, about the move from DLA to PIP, and they see that as a particular challenge. They say that they have about 8,000 people of working age currently on DLA, and many of those are on the lower rate, and that, of course, is, is uh, an area where there may be uh, a particular um, problem with the uh, PIP in that many will see themselves losing out on that. Um, the concern is that the stress of the situation may worsen uh, the, the condition of these people and place additional pressure on health and social work services. Um, and the DWP has erroneously been uh, uh, advising new claimants to wait uh, until June to claim <laughs> for uh, their benefit, um, but this, of course, was incorrect information that the Council has, has picked up. Um, uh, with universal credit, they also anticipate particular challenges uh, concerning the fact that the payment is to be made to one member of the household. Uh, they have, in fact, also had discussions in liaison with the local police um, to discuss potential impacts here where there could be a particular problem in week one when the money comes in and there could equally, equally be a potential problem in week four when the money has been spent uh, in many cases. Um, also, uh, the council in terms of staffing, the chief exec did make the point that uh, as far as the Scottish Welfare Fund is concerned, yes, it was implemented for the start date and it is, uh, it's being um, uh, applied uh, uh, in terms of, of uh, the legislation. But what they have found is that there has been a need to divert staff to deal uh, with the, um, the changed system and it's quite an intensive um, process and that as a result of that, uh, other issues are perhaps not receiving at this point the attention that they otherwise would have had. Uh, in terms of the Social Welfare Fund, their focus has been on trying to avoid providing hard cash so that, for example, they're looking at providing, uh, in connection with Transform, which will happen in the next wee while, furniture and bedding and electrical goods, for example, in terms of issues around uh, fuel poverty. What they seek to do is to send in the energy efficiency team and they will look at energy efficiency of that, um, uh, of that household, but also they will seek to help with respect to debt advice, rescheduling of debts, and in some cases they've managed to uh, write off uh, uh, debt. Uh, and so that has been a very good um, concrete help, practical help, uh, under the, the Social uh, Welfare Fund uh, uh, system. Um, uh, otherwise... Um, they're in general concerned that the increased pressures uh, in, in terms of um, the bedroom tax in particular uh, and in, in the welfare reform changes in general and uh, the increase in arrears that are likely to take place and indeed have taken place already in terms of rent payments that all the good work that has been done by the housing uh, department uh, including in particular with respect to homelessness uh, will be eroded as a result of these um, changes to the welfare uh, system. And um, also there are concerns about meeting the uh, SHQ's twos in 2016 because this target is to do with energy efficiency and, and money is otherwise not coming in that would have been expected to come in. They're concerned about the definition of um, uh, secure accommodation, the exemptions and temporary accommodation, as the committee has already noted. Uh, they did say that David Mandel had been to the committee and promised to get back to them with uh, answers to various queries that they had raised, and thus far he has not uh, replied to them with that outstanding uh, information. Um, and finally, um, they uh, have, in terms of uh, their welfare rights, what they're seeking to do is to, to ensure the earliest intervention possible uh, so that um, as the further rollout of the welfare uh, reforms uh, happen happens with the anticipated further challenges that that will entail, 
the earlier intervention that they can uh, uh, institute, the better, as far as they're concerned, because they can already flag up problems that are absolutely coming down the line and see if there's a way in anticipation of these further changes to try to uh, uh, mitigate these problems and thereby mitigate the uh, uh, further uh, very challenging impact that the welfare uh, reforms will have on uh, their tenants. A comprehensive report. Annabel, thanks very much. Uh, Linda and I went to the joint meeting with North and South Lanarkshire. Linda, do you want to? Yes, yes of course. Um, I'll I start <coughs> off convening if there's anything you want to add, of course. Um, we visited both North and South Lanarkshire in a, in a joint meeting. Um, officers of the council, elected members and partners such as Citizens Advice and uh, an organisation which name I can't remember, uh, which ties in with their work in terms of making sure people maximise their income as far as possible. Um, also, the those that were in charge of the pilot in South Lanarkshire, which is about um, the digitalisation. I, I think in context, it has to be recognised that Lanarkshire has high levels of deprivation and also has high levels of social housing. Um, thus, most of the discussion um, was around the bedroom tax. Uh, key challenges, <clears throat> complete inadequacy of the discretionary housing payments. I think that was a big issue. Both councils felt that they were very quickly um, using up discretionary housing payments for perfectly justifiable cases and were very, very concerned at other applications that would be coming in, all of which could also be justified. Also, the lack of suitably sized housing stock, um, because it's been very much over the years, both with councils um, and with housing associations, of supplying houses that would allow people to stay in them a long time and meet housing needs of growing families, for example. So there is a, a great lack of suitably sized housing stock if we're talking about moving people into, for example, one-bedroom houses and the, the additional cost of the welfare reforms. It was recognised that partnership working was absolutely essential. Um, so we had all the partners around the table, apart from uh, housing association representatives, which I, I noticed, uh, but we were assured um, that housing associations locally and the councils were working together. Uh, I think the overall aim is to, to try and get to people early to try and prevent some of which will come down down the line um, and end up with people going for crisis services. Um, uh, there was a recognition too that, that some of this work couldn't just be carried out overnight. Um, it was going to be a long-term process. Um, thus, those working in the field have to have a not just a detailed knowledge of, of what's going on, but a lot of patience, empathy and understanding as well. Uh, the direct costs to both councils for welfare reform and the money lost from the local economy as well, which is part of the wider issue, uh, is, is in the millions. But there's also an awful lot of indirect costs. And one of the issues that came up um, was the, the very good housing policies and allocation policies um, which councils and housing associations have, have worked on over the years to try and match the profile of their own communities. Despite what Mr Ian Duncan Smith said when he came to our meeting, where I think, um, to paraphrase him, was that Scotland had badly managed its social housing for decades, which I completely refute. It was more about building communities and, uh, and more about suiting people's needs in the short, medium and long term. So for an example that will make that clear is um, South Lanarkshire Council, for example, um, has long had a policy of not putting children under 14, I think it is, in high-rise flats uh, because of you know, the, those that live there are generally quite elderly and um, you know, some of the problems that can cause. So now all of a sudden you're in a situation where um, perhaps a potential of a mutual exchange comes up for a, a two-bedroomed high-rise um, from a family with one child, a baby, um, who are in a, a one-bedroomed flat elsewhere. So 
the council's allocation policy doesn't allow that move, but you are then putting somebody in the position where they're going to be in debt and perhaps lose their house in the longer term. So there's a lot of issues there about allocation policies as well. Um, and the councils will be um, very carefully looking for the potential of other funding and uh, money sources to help where that's possible. So there's a real concern about how these councils, both of them will shoulder the burden of these costs. And yes, it's been pilots, but they're recognising there's more of this to come and it's going to go on for a long time. Um, I did get the feeling that we're working very hard to try and mainstream some of this stuff in the recognition that it was going to go on for a long time. But already, both councils have got a rise in rent arrears um, and they noted first time rent arrears because of the bedroom tax. And that also raised a concern uh, because of the profile of of their residents that um, the only way that the councils would perhaps be able to meet some of this was to look at rent rises, which meant that those um, who were paying full or part rent already were going to shoulder the burden of some of these costs and that this could lead to a degree of resentment um, with, within the council stock because rents may need to increase without a corresponding improvement in services or in quality of housing. Um, and yes, as, as Annabelle said, that leads to concern about the commitment to meet the Scottish Housing Quality Standard. Um, so the, the financial implications of welfare reform could have a knock-on impact on that. Um, as far as digital exclusion was concerned, um, it, it was quite marked that uh, th there was a view that there was an expectation that um, how many people would be digitalised and, and be able to be comfortable with this. But however, the the forums themselves that have to be filled in online and the work that has to be done is complicated. So even those who can work their way um, around using computers and doing some stuff online were finding the, the forums themselves very difficult. So there was more work required within the communities than had originally uh, been said. Um, and a lovely phrase here that Heather has put in, which was, was used on that day, um, was that uh, these local authorities have a shared interest with the DWP. Obviously they do, and they have to work together, but they wanted to make it very, very plain that they didn't have a shared ambition. Um, we had some additional questions. Um, one was... You know, we've heard an awful lot of talk about uh, people can just take in a lodger you know, and all will be well and there'll be no problems. However, uh, we talked around that quite a lot and um, there was a very understandable reluctance among residents, among tenants to, to take in lodgers. Uh, there's real issues there about uh, perhaps a single woman um, with a spare bedroom taking a stranger into her home, uh, people with families taking strangers into their homes. Uh, and we did ask um, if we could have a case study to, to look at the knock-on impact of taking in a lodger, because it's all very well to say, well, that will meet that um, bedroom tax that you're having to pay. But there's other issues around that as far as credit's concerned. We, we have had a couple of case studies sent back. Um, I'm still trying to get my head around them because uh, I'm, I'm finding it quite difficult to understand the case studies that have come in. I don't know if you are too, convener. I'm not sure it looks at it in the complete round. The financial aspects uh -huh. of it, once you've got to take um, the contribution yes. into account, what that means in terms of the impact on else. benefits. Yeah, so it's, it's not it's quite not straightforward, straight but it's, it, looks. Uh, it just shows you the complexity of, of what we're dealing with. You know, a simplistic yeah. response that bring, take in a lodger as a solution to the problem. When you actually look at the complexity of doing that, it's far from a solution. Exactly. Um, and, and I think we need a little bit more work there, perhaps, as a committee to, to look at this. Um, but also it struck me that you can have all the case studies you like, you know, that are straight down the line as of, you know, this is how much this person will lose or gain. But what it's not taking into account is the, the other household costs around that. OK, you might not be feeding the person, but they're going to be using your gas, electricity, hot water and all these things. So so bills will rise. We were also, um, we, we also noted it being said that, you know, housing benefit claimants aren't 
aren't necessarily in receipt of full benefit. There was real concern expressed for those that are just on that margin that get a wee bit of housing benefit. You know, especially if rents have to go up to meet, uh, you know, other costs. Um, you know, people fall in and out of the, the housing benefit thing and get partial. Um, so I think it was very clear that we all wanted a recognition that an awful lot of people that get housing benefit are in low paid employment and paying, you know, most, at least a bit of their rent and just getting a, a bit of a help when, when things aren't great. So we have asked for some breakdowns of um, the, the levels of housing benefit claimants and full housing benefit as opposed to partial housing benefit. We don't have that, that in yet. As far as staff are concerned, um, there was another interesting thing came out which was about staff currently dealing with housing benefit um, and now they're having to deal um, with the council tax issues as well. And then universal credit comes in. And that thing about council staff, yes, they're used to dealing with housing benefit. They're not used to dealing with all the rest. So there's an, an ongoing staff training program there as well. Um, and will these staff be used in other areas? And again, the knock-on effect that can have in the councils uh, in their working practices. So all in all, it was really interesting. But what I would say is that that for us, it, it created more questions than answers. And, and there's a bit more work to be done there and ongoing monitoring. Thank Again, you. very comprehensive report, Linda. Thanks very much. Uh, yesterday, Jamie and I were at Western Partnership. Jamie, do you want to give us some feedback from that? Yes, certainly. Uh, convener and uh, First of all, I think I should place in record a thanks to Western Bartonshire Council. They gave us uh, quite a bit of time and they also provided us a, a number of uh, senior uh, members of uh, staff and also a number of uh, folk who are working on the front line. Western Bartonshire is, of course, uh, involved in one of the DWP uh, pilots, uh, which is to assess the impact of uh, universal credits, uh, universal credit being introduced. And in terms of uh, the uh, pilot uh, itself, there was some a concern expressed about uh, the type of meaningful impact the pilot might have uh, on uh, the implementation of universal credit, what lessons might be learnt. And this obviously ties with stuff we've heard elsewhere. To be fair, it wasn't so much in terms of the evidence that it was uh, being uh, gathered. They were uh, fairly clear that the DWP are in regular dialogue with them uh, and uh, are seem to be uh, listening to what they're saying, but I think it was more due to the uh, timing of uh, the pilot, and in that regard, uh, they're actually hoping to extend uh, their pilot. It was uh, uh, meant to finish in September, and they've asked DWP for an extension, which uh, is apparently being considered uh, just now. In terms of uh, the introduction of uh, the various welfare reforms, a, a number of uh, general uh, concerns were uh, raised uh, in terms of uh, the digital by default, Agenda, uh, it was pointed out that the last available figures indicated that less than 30 per cent of uh, Western Berkshire households had access to broadband. Uh, it was also suggested that a number, a large number of people who present uh, for uh, support with trying to uh, upskill and uh, get uh, support to enter the job market uh, don't really have uh, any uh, level of IT skills. Uh, and another, I thought, quite an interesting uh, point was made, they seem to have a focus group that works with uh, their client base uh, and an issue that was raised around the uh, default, digital by default uh, agenda was concerns about uh, the privacy and security of using the internet, just general concerns about using the internet generally and where that information might go, but also if people are being asked to uh, use uh, the internet in public locations and uh, 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 computers that might be shared, uh, how uh, uh, their information uh, can be uh, kept secure. So that was a concern that was raised. Uh, there was also uh, concerns uh, about uh, the enormous culture shift moving to uh, a single uh, monthly payment. People are used to uh, regular smaller payments and budgeting. Uh, there was also a concern about the impact on uh, the council itself through a direct payment of housing benefit, a matter we've heard uh, uh, many times. There were also concerns about uh, the uh, appeal uh, process for uh, ESA. Um, it was suggested to us that some 72 per cent of uh, appeals uh, that are taken forward by Western Berkshire Council to, to, from th for those who ask and seek their help uh, are won, uh, and that's a fairly steady 
uh, figure, and there was a suggestion that this would um, uh, indicate that there's something uh, wrong with the DWP decision making process um, when you're getting that high level of success in terms of uh, appeals, and there was a concern that this will just continue uh, uh, even when the, uh, the welfare reforms are, are fully put in uh, place. There's also uh, much comment about uh, this committee's own research uh, that we commissioned from uh, Sheffield Hallam University, uh, which of course identified Western Berkshire as one of the, uh, the areas that's uh, hardest hit uh, in terms of uh, loss of uh, payments and there was concern about the impact on the various local economies within uh, Western Berkshire. Also some concerns about the uh, pressures on uh, council uh, services. Uh, uh, Western Berkshire, obviously, I think most councils have topped up uh, its uh, pot of money for discretionary housing payments. Uh, I've got my handwritten notes here. I've got £500,000 written down here, which I think was uh, correct. And they had uh, around 600 applications uh, by the first day of the scheme and expecting all their funds to be fully committed uh, by September. And there was concern expressed about future years because we know that, that the money that's going to be provided by the UK government for discretionary housing payments is going to be further uh, squeezed. So they're concerned about the pressure uh, that it might uh, come to bear in future years. In terms of the Scottish Welfare Fund, um, there was a suggestion that it was taking it taken a, a while for people to realise it was there, starting to notice pick up and demand for it. Um, but they were uh, pretty clear that there should be uh, enough uh, funds uh, to cover uh, need in Western Barnetshire through the Scottish Welfare Fund, unlike uh, discretionary uh, housing payments. They've had to build in, I think again, half a million pounds for bad debt provision for housing revenue budget. So that uh, falls on from the concern about the uh, impact on uh, their housing uh, budget. Uh, they're expecting increased pressure on social work, uh, education services and reduced uh, pressure on uh, leisure and recreational services, libraries and leisure centres uh, and uh, the rest of it. Uh, they also uh, mentioned that they are presently involved in trying to establish a food bank in Western Bartonshire. Um, and uh, we're saying that anecdotally uh, they are aware of people who present to them who have been taking food out of skips from local retailers when they uh, close and they said that these tend to be folk who have been uh, sanctioned. Uh, so they wanted obviously to put that on the record as a concern. With all these concerns expressed, I think we should uh, point out, convener, and I'm sure you would uh, uh, back this up, that there seemed to be a lot of good work actually going on uh, in terms of trying to mitigate uh, the worst effects of welfare reform, uh, in terms of the advice services they have, in terms of, especially, I got the impression, in terms of the services they have in trying to uh, upskill folk and uh, get them into uh, employment, they uh, were able to report uh, quite a high uh, level of success through their uh, employability uh, programme. Uh, I think they had got about 500 people into work over a two-year uh, period, which would uh, suggest quite a, a high level of success. But of course, uh, the concern is that as the welfare reforms come through, uh, uh, that's going to be uh, harder to uh, sustain. And one last thing I thought would be worth uh, mentioning, because uh, it seemed, seemed to me quite an innovative uh, suggestion. Uh, members will recall it. I uh, mentioned their concern, the council's concern about the switch to uh, the single monthly payment of universal credit as opposed to the regular uh, uh, payments of different benefit, which is a huge uh, culture shift. Uh, the council actually uh, mentioned that due to a change in the way they're paying their own staff, um, they, uh, they seem to pay sort of more regularly than uh, monthly, uh, but they've worked with local banks to try and come up with a way that, although they'll be paying their employees on a, a monthly basis, the, uh, the banks locally will provide another type of account that they can draw uh, down more uh, regularly so that it doesn't uh, seem to impact on them uh, in any discernible way. And there's a suggestion, could something similar be done with the banks with universal credit so that although the person might be getting that singular monthly uh, payment in terms of when they go to the, uh, the bank, uh, it's been drawn down on a, a more regular basis, something more akin to uh, 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 the type of, of uh, uh, pattern of payment they're getting just now. I thought it was quite an innovative suggestion. I don't know how practical it might be, but it might be something worth uh, uh, considering for this committee. Yeah. 
And there was a, a certainly an interesting um, suggestion that was brought forward, and they've been working hard on it. And we've asked them to keep us updated uh, with their progress on that, as uh, we've asked them to give us some inform uh, additional information on some of the other aspects of the, the work that they're undertaking. And that brings us to our final um, report back. Again, we're coming back to Annabelle, who was with Ian Gray at West Lothian. Annabelle. Yes, thank you, Convener. Uh, so we attended at West Lothian uh, Council uh, some weeks ago, um, and we met again with, um, I think, the Head of Finance and other senior officials and some uh, relevant um, councillors. Uh, and again, there were very interesting presentations. Um, so in terms of the uh, overall estimated impact by 2014-15 uh, to West Lothian Council, that is estimated to be around £57 million. Pounds. Um, and in terms of what West Lothian Council have been doing, again, they have uh, taken a very proactive approach and a welfare reform working group has been established uh, and it uh, again has work streams uh, to do with uh, the universal credit, bedroom tax, well they call it size restrictions, they refer to the issue as size restrictions. I'm trying to be diplomatic, Alec will be impressed. And um, uh, so they have a work stream also in the Scottish Welfare Fund on personal independence payment and council tax reduction. Uh, what they're trying to do also is to feed this work into the council's anti-poverty strategy. Uh, so that uh, you know, the, the, there's one uh, kind of common uh, approach being taken. Um, uh, the plan is to work across services for each work stream, and uh, there is a report to elected members each quarter on progress. Um, what also the, cust the council was trying to do is to build up an enhanced picture of uh, its um, its clients through uh, various work being undertaken. Uh, uh, and to ensure that there is communication of the changes that are happening uh, and they also use um, social media uh, in this respect, Twitter and Facebook in particular, and they also have had uh, stands uh, set up in local shopping centres to try to reach as many uh, tenants as possible. Um, in that respect, I think, and again it's picking up from uh, something that was mentioned at Dundee City Council, um, they have... Um, tried to communicate um, by letter, but there tends to be quite a low response rate, I believe. So they are trying other ways to ensure that they have uh, uh, the opportunity to meet face-to-face -face, uh, with uh, tenants where possible. Um, in terms of digital exclusion, uh, uh, West Lothian Council said that just over 50% of council tenants have access to the internet, which is really quite an astonishingly low figure. Uh, 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 in terms of, of what you would expect, uh, I think, in terms of the 21st century. Um, so this is a major issue. They have come up with a digital inclusion action plan uh, seeking to improve internet access and have also applied to the big lottery for some funding to help with this. Um, what, uh, In terms of the welfare changes, what they are particularly concerned about is um, the, the need to ensure that uh, the framework for localised claimant support is maintained and is resourced, and this is something that the DWP is supposed to be doing. It is not clear what, what they are doing in that respect, and there's concerns that uh, the resources are not going into that. And given the low level of digital access, that is a very important uh, element to ensure that people get the entitlement uh, they require. Um, uh, the, also, the council expressed concern about uh, that the pilots would run beyond implementation dates. They referred to the Dunedin Canmore project, uh, and they understand that whilst the actual findings of that report are not in the public domain per se, nonetheless it is believed to be an extremely resource-intensive uh, project and um, general uncertainty here about rollout and, and pilots and the upshot of the pilots and the timing of universal credit which seems to have been put on some sort of different path with lack of information coming from the DWP about when uh, the universal credit will be rolled out. On the Scottish Welfare Fund, they uh, 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 reported that um, that's working fine at the moment. The, the demand actually um, is considerably lower uh, than they had anticipated at this point, but they did expect that that demand would increase over time. 
Again, they try to um, uh, provide ways of helping people beyond simply handing out cash. So they, if white goods are needed, there's a local supplier where white goods can be provided. I believe at very reasonable cost, again, with furniture. And it seems to be a feature of, of all the councils are trying to be very innovative in the way that they seek to help people under the Social Welfare Fund and that the help is sustainable over the longer term. It's not just a kind of rolling door, revolving door. Um, on discretionary housing payment, um, so their grant is, uh, I think, £180,000. Uh, there has been a very, very significant increase in applications under DHP, uh, the Discretionary Housing Fund. Um, and obviously there are huge concerns about um, what happens next. Um, bedroom tax or the size restrictions, as they referred to, they estimate the cost to the council about two million a year. Um, and uh, as I say, they had sought to write to tenants, but there seems to be you know, poor engagement on that basis. Um, uh, so they've been trying to engage in other uh, ways. Uh, they do have house building plans to build about 1,000 homes over the next four years uh, and the plan is to, to make provision for uh, uh, you know, smaller accommodation um, but I guess discussions are still ongoing as to how that actually is to be worked out in practice. Um, uh, the Council is aiming to get a, a, a more general assessment of the impact of all welfare changes going forward, looking at household profiles, uh, looking at both therefore direct and indirect impacts. Um, obviously, there's a concern that there will be uh, a negative impact on uh, or threat at least to existing council priorities and the delivery of them in light of these welfare changes and to council services, um, uh, including in particular the um, early uh, intervention strategy uh, and there'll be very severe uh, challenges to that um, uh, in terms of existing priorities. Um, um, the council feel that they are doing all they can to mitigate against the direct impact of welfare changes. Um, uh, it's more difficult for them in terms of indirect impact. And they want to look at um, data uh, concerning other issues in terms of um, uh, criminal justice matters, uh, looking at uh, uh, other issues concerning employment, education, so that they're looking at the, the, the issue in the round in terms of the services they provide as a council. Uh, and they are working out ways to gather data that will be meaningful for them to make um, decisions going forward so that the impact of welfare is seen as something affecting really every aspect of the Council's um, work. Um, again, the, they face all the unknowns uh, that we've discussed, uh, talking in particular about migration arrangements from DLA to PIP and the rollout of universal credit uh, what will happen to the Scottish Welfare Fund a couple of years down the line, um, and um, also concerns about the DWP being a bit prescriptive about the, how the Council can deliver support uh, services in terms of information and so forth. Um, and there was also some concern about um, staffing issues, again, uh, with staff being used for other purposes and... and um, uh, you know, potential impacts on staff down the line. Um, uh, and uh, I think, convener, there was probably some, a few other issues, but I think that covers a lot of the meeting. It was a very good, very, very good meeting. Both of them were, I was happy yeah. to say. No, thanks very much, Annabelle. I think um, colleagues have sort of shown that there's a lot of work being undertaken out there in these projects, uh, the, um, the, the pilot studies. And I think the information is going to be invaluable, um, whether it gets taken on board and anything's taken forward. Um, once this information is fed uh, back to the DWP, it uh, remains to be seen. Uh, but certainly I think we want to be doing something constructive with this information. Um, and there are some common themes there, but I also think there are individual issues that each of the, the pilots has brought out. And I, I noticed, uh, you know, not that the information was at odds with one another, but I was, uh, you know, the, from the two that I attended, um, South Lanarkshire Council looking at the, the digital inclusion, 
Yes, they identified as Western Bartonshire did the, the lack of uh, access to uh, computers uh, and systems was was a problem, and uh, both local authorities had identified that it was very resource intensive to try and um, pursue and identify people that they could engage with at the earliest opportunity to get them involved in this process. But South Lanarkshire Council commented that once they had done that and had established links with people, that they found people engaging with it and, and trying to work the system uh, effectively, whereas Western Bartonshire had identified a, a problem with literacy and uh, and even when they had had engaged with people, it was it was difficult to, to get them involved in the process. So, well, there are common themes that are equally there are individual uh, issues, and I think if we can try and draw them out, pull them. Uh, together in a report, that would, that would be useful. Uh, just one other comment before opening up to colleagues. I'll come to Kenny first. Um, but you know, the one thing that struck me yesterday, I actually had to pinch myself. Um, the deputy convener mentioned it in, in his feedback that when you're listening to council officials talking about their experiences and, and things that have emerged as they've uh, undertaken this work to address the, the welfare reform changes, to have established a picture whereby people in their area are waiting at the back of supermarkets to raid skips to pick up food to feed themselves. It just beggars belief that any system, regardless of whether you believe in, in welfare reform, you know, and uh, what direction it should go, it should not surely be taken us in a direction where people are having to raid skips at the back of supermarkets to feed themselves and their families. That is just abhorrent. Um, and whatever is broken in this system, that has to be fixed. That That is just the most appalling thing I think that I've heard in, in many a long day in this parliament. Uh, and if we can't get something looked at to address that kind of problem, then, then we're failing in, in what we're doing here. So we need to start looking at these uh, types of things and, and seeing what is exactly um, at the back of that, because that cannot be acceptable in, in any modern society in this day and age. Ken, I'll come to you to make Aye, any Thanks comments. very uh, much, Camille. I appreciate that. I mean, obviously, I wasn't on any of the, the, the kind of visits, so it was quite fascinating for me to actually listen to uh, what actually was uh, was happening. And I think what is the most interesting for me is incredible variation in the methodology by which uh, local authorities are dealing with the, the welfare uh, reform agenda and the difficulties that is presented. I mean, I was quite struck by the, the number of ideas, the level of innovation, the dedication of local authorities and their staff, the kind of flexibility that we've actually seen also in how this has been addressed. And I think your idea of a report is an excellent one, Convener, because I think it's important that we feed back what has actually been picked up from uh, these six visits, not just to the six themselves, but also to all of the 32 local authorities and indeed COSLA, because I think there's an opportunity for local authorities um, you know, to, to look at actually what other uh, local authorities are doing. Uh, and uh, the, 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 you, you almost, I think, this can have a kind of coordinating role here by the, the kind of work that you, you've actually done and show how some councils are addressing this matter, which other councils may actually have not thought of but might actually pick up. Uh, I think, uh, and they could then, therefore, not only uh, adopt uh, methods, but uh, um, where necessary, adapt them. I also share your concerns um, with regard to uh, what you've just mentioned in, in terms of Western Bartonshire and people having to read skips. I mean, I think that shows the flaws of the whole welfare reform agenda. Uh, full stop. Colleagues, if you want to make, Jamie? You know, I, just, I, I just wonder, I mean, I think Kenny's uh, suggestion is actually very uh, helpful, and I just wonder if it would be in order for us to uh, pull together. I mean, I don't suppose it could be a formal report as such because we're not going through the, the whole formal process of going through a, a, an entire inquiry. But I think pulling together some sort of report that draws all this evidence together would be very helpful. The only thing I would suggest is we've still got two visits to do, convener. Yeah, so yeah, I, 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 I think um, I think we should probably wait till we've done all that and gather all that evidence. And I wonder if the clerks, once that's done, can we pull something together that could be presented to us early? Uh, upon a return from uh, uh, the recess, um, and, and you know, take it forward then. Yeah, that was certainly what I was suggesting. Because th th there has been a lot of work, and uh, all this has been compiled by those uh, the, the clerks who have been out with us. So we we do have some documentation, and we're going to get additional information from all of the the places that we visited. So we could, I say, not necessarily come up with recommendations, what have you, but certainly compile this together 
and identify themes and uh, issues that have, have come out of the. Yeah. I mean, more or less, the, without recommendation, given it, you know the stuff we're getting speaks for itself. Really. Almost, yeah. Um, Alex, and then Linda. Yeah, they, having listened to the reports, it's obvious that the experience differs in, in different areas, and uh, I quite agree what. Uh, Kenny had to say uh, a minute or two ago that uh, there is an opportunity for best practice to be shared uh, and to be moved around. However, they, there is, of course, um, more than one potential reason for why the experience is different in different areas. And that could well be that, of course, the, uh, the reliance on welfare differs in certain areas and consequently it has a different uh, impact when the reform process takes place. But I've heard uh, a number of comments made uh, during the, the, the feedback that we've had from the visits, such as the suggestion that some councils don't have a shared ambition with the uh, Department of Work and Pensions. Uh, another one was the suggestion that the welfare reform progress may cut across council priorities. Uh, and that indicates to me that there is uh, at least a suggestion that there may be some councils whose um, who may have an ideological objection uh, to the changes that are taking place. And consequently, uh, there may be some councils who are more active uh, in trying to make the, the system work than others are. So I'm concerned to ensure that uh, while we look at the, the information that's being fed back, that we ensure that we do look to see if there's any evidence that success uh, may occur be occurring in the areas where council engagement is greatest and that uh, some of the, the difficulties may be concentrated in areas where the political objection to the process is most notable. It wonder. Uh, well, I have an, ideolog I have an ideological <laughs> objection um, to the aims of the welfare reform and to people um, scrabbling about in skips to try and eat. And, um, and I think what I'm concerned about is that, yes, I totally get what, what Kenny was saying and what Alex said about looking at best practice because we do have to do our best to try and mitigate some of this and, as far as possible, um, <coughs> make it as painless as possible for those who are directly affected. But I also don't think that we should lose um, the feeling of this committee, whatever that feeling may be when we get to discuss these things, about um, what is actually happening to people in our own communities and to people in our own country. And if this committee feels that we want a very, very strong message sent to DWP, who are having to work the ambition of the coalition government. It's not about the, the officers and the people that work in DWP. The ambition is the government's, and I certainly don't share it, and I, and I recognise why neither North nor South Lanarkshire councils share it. So it's two strands here. It's yes, um, we can disseminate best practice as far as we possibly can, but we also have to very clearly uh, lay out the impacts of welfare reform um, to our communities. And if one of these impacts is that people are going to food banks um, and people are, are you know, going around for food because they've been sanctioned, not always fairly, we heard that in evidence, um, I think that has to be brought out very clearly and I think this committee should be making a big noise about that. Uh, Annabelle and then Jamie. Yeah, I, I think it's... Um I think it's not really helpful uh, for Alex Johnson to suggest that, you know, if, if, if individuals at their workplace have particular views privately, that somehow they're not, you that somehow they're not... You, you uh, misunderstand me. Annabelle makes a point. I'll let you come back and respond. That yeah. somehow they're not doing the job. Uh, what I have taken away from both visits to both West Lothian, which was the first visit a couple of weeks ago, and to Dundee yesterday is that um, the, the whole council has been mobilised behind both councils, behind trying to do their very best for all the people that they're providing services to across their council areas. And it's a, a whole staff buy-in to that, uh, and staff working in all departments uh, to ensure that people are helped to see if there is something out there to which they are entitled that they're not currently getting, to see if they can be helped so that they're not losing what is really a big part of their income uh, every week through no fault of their own. Um, and the other point about cutting across kinds of priorities, I mean, the point was being made that in terms of priorities that are already in place, which are good priorities 
priorities dealing with homelessness. Very successful in the case of Dundee City Council, for example, policies on homelessness. I, the danger is that they will be undone. They will be undone by the impact of the UK government's welfare reform uh, uh, changes. Uh, and also, uh, in terms of housing uh, policy, uh, and it was explained yesterday that um, you know many one-bedroom properties would be sought by uh, uh, an individual male. Uh, the point of the housing allocation policy over many years has been to have mixed communities mixed communities mm -hmm. and therefore the suggestion that in order to meet this ridiculous uh, tax imposed by the UK government for a problem that isn't in existence in Scotland uh, uh, to any meaningful extent that we have to then change our whole housing policy allocations to meet this one policy. Uh, it was suggested also for example that actually there's no definition of a bedroom under the Housing uh, Scotland Act. Uh, but that doesn't really take the councils any further because if they were to seek to make designations where you wall up a bedroom and the old light tax where you put bricks across a window, which it seems we're back to, and that was, I think, the 19th century, uh, but if you were to seek to make changes, you wouldn't be making changes to just the odd property. You'd be making changes to all properties falling within that category throughout the council area. And you would then uh, have, in turn, ridiculous um, posturings where you couldn't house people in accommodation actually would fit them because you had reclassified it to be something else and you wouldn't be allowed to. So uh, that's the point about cutting across house, uh, council priorities, particularly in terms of housing, but also in terms of the very important early years uh, uh, intervention uh, and early uh, intervention in general, which is identified as a, a key way forward in delivering public services in the future in Scotland. So. This is, this is cutting across uh, these very good uh, policies already in place, priorities already identified, and that, for both the councils I went to, is a major, major concern. I'll let Alex respond to the point that Annabelle made, and then I'll, I'll ask Jamie to make the final comment, because we've got other items that we need to get on with. Uh, Annabelle appeared at one point to suggest that I had suggested that the opinions of individuals uh, within councils at any level uh, were being uh, influential in the way that this policy was being implemented. Uh, I'd like to say that that is not what I suggested uh, and it is not what I intended. Nor did I intend uh, in any way to suggest that individual councils uh, are uh, either failing in their duty to implement these changes or implementing it in a way uh, that I might suggest is inappropriate. What I was suggesting is that there appears to be different experience and there appears to be a, a different uh, level of engagement in the process at different local authorities. And I would be concerned to ensure that we can assess whether the way in which councils choose to engage is either ruled in or ruled out as uh, one of the factors in the success uh, or otherwise of the implementation of these changes. Okay, I think that's clarified your position, Alex. That's all right. Jamie, if you want to have the final say on this. Okay, side. well, I mean, I probably shouldn't give you, I can't help myself. I mean, in terms of the, uh, the suggestion that um, councils might be ideological entities, I mean, councils are political entities, so it's perfectly legitimate for them to be ideological entities, I suppose. And, the other mm -hmm. observation I would make is that we shouldn't pretend that this entire process of welfare reform isn't somewhat ideologically driven. But that said, um, uh, uh, you know, in terms of Alex's wider suggestion, you know, we've got other information. We wrote to all uh, 32 local authorities, so as part of this process, I mean, we could perhaps look at. I know we didn't get responses from all 32, and we we can't demand that we get responses from all 32, but we have. Uh, um, the, the benefit of some uh, feedback uh, from there. So I wonder if we could maybe look at working some of that into this as well, and that might Absolutely. satisfy some of the, the concerns that have been expressed about um, trying to, to get a wider uh, sample. I, I completely agree with you, Jamie. As I said, my, my suggestion at the outset was that we're compiling information here, we're, we're bringing things together, and there should be something at the end of it. We've still got a couple of visits to do. There's still more information coming in from local authorities, and I think what we want to have at the end of this is something concrete that, that people can uh, see uh, what we've uh, pulled together. Um, as I said, it might not necessarily be a report with recommendations, but certainly uh, a document which contains all of the, the information that we've uh, um, been able to draw out, um, and then it can be used to share as uh, best practice or uh, for people to learn uh, from our experiences. Um, I think everyone seems to be in agreement on that.
Okay, so we'll keep working forward on that basis. Um, and I'll close that uh, agenda item and go to our next one. This is agenda item three, the work capability assessments. Um, this is to consider whether to take further action on the response uh, the committee received to its freedom of information request for, uh, to the, D the DWP on the geographical breakdown of work capability assessment figures for Scotland. I think everyone's seen them. And we do have a paper which suggests a couple of things that we could do uh, on the back of that information. Colleagues have had a chance to look at it. I'll open up to, to suggestions. Are you happy with the, yep. the recommendations? I think both the recommendations are not being pursued. Yep, we'll do that yeah, then. I think so. Well, I, I just wanted clarification. So the uh, the, the GP's uh, contracts, I mean, are, are they the jurisdiction of the Scottish Government Health Department yes. or the UK Government? Is it their de de distinct contracts with the Scottish government? Right. I, no, I don't think it's as clear cut. The BMA yeah. negotiated them across the UK, but I think the, the NHS in Scotland have responsible for the, right. the implementation. Yeah, I think that's how it works. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Everybody seems quite happy with that. Yep. Uh, that being the case, we move into private session uh, to take agenda item four. I'll close the meeting at that last point to the public.